who is going to carry out the transformations that would make a permanent revolution a reality in countries like Egypt and Tunisia. Tunisia and Egypt and the struggles across the Middle East and North Africa have once again put revolution on the actual living agenda of the world movement. So also have the struggles in Greece and Spain. Now there are three talks in this series and if you're following the series you'll probably find there's some overlap between them and I hope there aren't too many contradictions between the speakers because otherwise we'll have to have a fight afterwards, we'll see. Um, now, I'm going to go plunge straight in. What is a revolutionary situation? And there are two sources I'm going to draw on. The most important one is Trotsky. And I'll start with the simplest definition of a revolutionary situation that Trotsky gives. It is a situation of dual power. And I'll come back to this, what it means. Dual power, two words. There's a longer definition. Uh, also two words, <laughs> but two longer words, uh, from an American political scientist who died a few years ago, political scientist and historian called Charles Tilley, and he called it multiple sovereignty. But it's really dual power with longer words. Um, but what he did, he's not very helpful for understanding the dynamics, Charles Tilley is not very helpful for understanding the dynamics of a revolutionary situation, but he's very sharp into giving us a nice sparse definition of what it is. He says it's got three features. The first one is that the existing state loses control of part of its power to contenders. It doesn't say who the contenders are, but the existing state loses part of its power to contenders. Somebody is, has taken away part of its power. The second thing is that the contenders, whoever they are, have got some support from quote unquote a significant part of the population doesn't say how big that is or how we measure significant nonetheless a significant part of the population supports and the third part of it is that the existing state can't yet repress the contenders and their supporters okay that's very sparse but it's actually quite useful i think for identifying what a revolutionary situation is what it means is there's a political crisis affecting a whole country. That's absolutely central to the definition of a revolutionary situation. Now, if you use this really sparse definition, then you can actually say some quite useful things with it. The first thing you can say is that not everything we might think of as a revolutionary situation is a revolutionary situation. For example, it's a famous example, what happened in, in France in 1968 was not a revolutionary situation. You might think, but surely it must have been. I mean, all those student movements and then the biggest general strike in European history, uh, at that time in world history, surely that must have been a revolutionary situation. But listen to what the definition says. Had the state lost control of, a, of any particular part of its power? Was there a, a rival for power in France, that are, around which people were organizing, which is gaining support. Were there popular institutions, for example, like workers' councils emerging, challenging for state control in France in 1968? And the answer is, sadly, no. And that's why it didn't last very long. The general strike ended after a few weeks. The student movement, it rose as somebody wrote, I think Cliff or <coughs> Ian Birch or somebody wrote at the time, what was characteristic of the May events was that they rose like a rocket and, as people say about the student movement, fell like a stick. It was all over quite quickly and not much remained afterwards. Okay? Now, that's one kind of uh, dis distinction we can make. So, another kind which is really important for understanding revolutions in the last 25 years before Egypt and Tunisia, or before Tunisia and Egypt to be chronologically accurate. There's a whole series of revolutions that have happened in the world since 1976. That's to say, changes in the structure of state power uh, of a major kind, which 
have been revolutionary situations, only they didn't really smell right from the socialist point of view. Okay, but I think we have to say they were revolutionary transitions. Spain, 1976, the, the end of, of fascism in Spain, 1976. What happened? There was a pact between the Communist Party, Socialist Party, and the old regime to change things, to introduce parliamentary democracy. 1989, in Poland and in Hungary, there was a change from quote-unquote communism, state capitalism, to parliamentary democracy in those countries. Were there mass demonstrations in the streets like in East Germany and uh, Czechoslovakia? No. Nope. But there was a negotiated pact. There were round tables, they were called, held between the opposition and the government, which changed the regime. South Africa, even South Africa, against a background of massive demonstrations in the 80s, the struggle of, of millions of black South Africans against the apartheid regime, how was it actually accomplished? There was a deal struck between the ANC, including the Communist Party in South Africa, and the old regime, and what, was the, what are the terms of these kinds of deals? There will be no prosecutions, or not much in the way of prosecutions, of former murderers and torturers. We will protect the privileges of, the old, of many of the old, uh, old guard, as it were, the old uh, ruling class. And the key thing is, the opposition, in coming, being allowed to come to power, will contain popular insurgency and promote private capitalist interests. And that's what happened in Spain. That's what happened in East Germany. That's what happened in many of the, uh, uh, the ending of military dictatorship in many parts of Latin America in the 1980s. They were called, the, some of the political scientists call these negotiated transitions, okay? There was a process, I'll borrow a term from Tony Cliff, they were deflected revolutions. And you can see what the agents of deflection were. In the case of uh, Spain, the key agent of deflection is the French Communist Party which enters into an agreement that there will not be mass strikes, etc., etc., etc. The whole thing will be contained. It will not be like Portugal. Who did it in Poland? The intellectuals of solidarity entered into a pact that they will contain the movement and then they, uh, then they introduce the free market. Um, in South Africa, it was the African National Congress, Nelson Mandela, the Communist Party, etc., etc., that has produced a South Africa which, in which uh, there have been no real economic gains for the mass of the black population, etc., etc., etc. Now, there were revolutions, but the, the revolutionary situation was all over in, it was all, the revolutionary situation was conducted around a round table. Now, that's not very exciting, to be honest. And the possibilities for socialist development are being contained by this process, okay? But now we come to 2011 and now we come to the revival of a different kind of revolutionary situation when we look at Tunisia and especially Egypt because there are other kinds of revolutionary situations they also conform to the to the definition but they contain much wider possibilities and I'm going to you'll be pleased to hear I'm going to focus most of my attention on those because they're the ones that are of greatest interest to socialists one thing about them is they're more drawn out in terms of time and this, this permits crucial, it opens up crucial possibilities of development amongst workers and other popular forces, peasants, etc., etc. Very characteristic of a drawn out revolutionary situation that there is no straight line which leads from the revolutionary situation to the situation of dual power to the revolutionary outcome. Nothing has been settled by the beginning of the revolutionary process. Everything is to play for. That's a characteristic. Now, if you look at uh, past revolutions, and it also applies, for example, to what happened in Tunisia and Egypt, it's very commonly the case that revolutionary processes begin with a massive display of popular unity. Everybody is together. You look at uh, Tahrir Square in February. Everybody is united in joy in the beginning of the Portuguese Revolution, in, in uh, the spring of 1974, they called it the Revolution of Flowers. What do you see? Soldiers in the streets with flowers in their bayonets which have been put there by working people, etc., etc. Fantastic. Uh, 
Um, now Marx talked about the February Revolution in 1848 as being the beautiful revolution. When every, there's a sense of popular unity, uh, joy, the old tyrants have been overthrown, etc. Unfortunately, well, actually it's quite important, not simply unfortunately, fortunately, things carry on from there and the brief crisis, the, the, brief, the brief crisis that engendered well, the, the, not the brief crisis, the crisis that engendered the revolutionary situation in the first place reasserts itself and it, divisions begin to emerge amongst the ranks of those who overthrew the old regime. Trotsky has a very nice phrase for describing the early phase, phrase, phases of a revolutionary situation. He says it's the politics of flabbiness. Why? Because the, old, the, the new rulers have come into power can't yet impose their will very clearly. You look at the army in <coughs> Egypt, for example, which says, right, now we're in power, no more strikes. And what happens? Rising numbers of strikes. They can't stop the strike. I mean, they can try, and they've, they've, they've attacked some strikes, but nothing is settled yet. On the other hand, the other side is also not ready yet, still deciding what he wants to do, still arguing about what is possible, still feeling perhaps disappointed with the outcome of the first phase of the revolution. As Trotsky put it, the young bones of the revolution are still soft. Um, so this is a very nice phrase. It hasn't grown up yet, the revolution. It's still feeling its way. There's another thing. Very often it's the case that those who carry out the beginning process of a revolution are a minority in society. Sometimes a big minority, but still a minority. Um, who began the Russian Revolution of 1917? The answer is the ordinary working people of Petrograd, along with the soldiers of Petrograd who joined them. But Petrograd really was the storm centre of the February Revolution, and Petrograd gave the overthrow of Tsarism to the rest of Russia. The rest of Russia was not largely involved. They had to catch up, they had to become involved, they had to become part of it over the succeeding months, with all sorts of interesting consequences. Who overthrew Mubarak? I saw an estimate, I think it's by Mustafa Omar, a uh, very fine comrade who's written a number of interesting articles about the Egyptian <coughs> revolution. He said, his estimate was 25% of the adult population of Egypt participated in the revolution. Now that's a big percentage. It's actually a minority though. It means 75% didn't. They sat at home. They might have watched it on television, they might have been very pleased, um, and so on. They might have been baffled, they might have been astonished, they might have been all sorts of things, but they didn't participate. Okay, so all oh, there, those huge crowds in Tahrir Square, still a minority, okay? Now, if it's going to be a socialist revolution, you have to talk about a majority. So there's a, it begins with a minority, but then it can widen and it can deepen the process of a revolution after the initiating uh, process. And in the, what, what helps it to do so, there's a number of things I want to mention. One of them is what Rosa Luxemburg talked about in her wonderful pamphlet, The Mass Strike, which if you haven't read it, read it for pure joy. Um, she describes how in the process of ma revolutionary mass strikes, political demands and economic demands interplay with each other. What happens in Egypt? Towards, as, as the revolution is happening, but especially afterwards, is that workers begin to feel confident to raise economic demands. And the last thing we should do is say, oh, there are only economic demands. You know, we're revolutionaries. We're, in, we're, we're about political demands. What does it mean? The first time for lots of these workers, they feel confident enough to say, we want a pay increase. And sometimes more interesting demands. We want to get rid of this boss, and so on. Also, the, the sense of Pow empowerment which comes is something that grows and it only grows with trying it out and very often and so economic demands and the growth of and swelling of economic demands increases the sense of popular empowerment and that can feed into politics as politics political demonstrations can feed also into economic demands and the two can reinforce each other in their, pro in their, in their progress. It's a vital part of the revolutionary process that people assert local demands, not simply national demands and international demands, but local demands about their conditions, whether it be peasants demanding the land back from landlords, uh, whether it's workers demanding higher wages or shorter hours or get rid of this foreman or whatever. 
because what they gain from this is a sense of their own, their confidence in themselves, what they gain is a sense of the possibility of links with others, uh, and so on. So another thing, again, Egypt is a nice example. If you've just overthrown an old tyrant, and the new regime has said, yes, the old tyrant was an old tyrant and he had to go, this means that the new regime has to admit there was something wrong with what went before. They needn't be very specific about what it was, and they may come up with some very absurd accounts of, of this. Like the World Bank explains the uh, suicide of the man who started the, um, <coughs> the revolution in Tunisia with his suicide as explaining that World Bank says it's because he was lacking economic opportunities uh, to compete in the market freely. Uh, and that's, uh, that's their explanation of his suicide. They're trying to contain what happened in terms of the, not the framework of neoliberalism, as if he was a neoliberal revolutionary. Okay. <laughs> but they have to pay obeisance, as it were, to the idea that something was bad in the past. And then the question is, how bad was it, and how big was the bad? Okay, Mubarak has gone. But then people start saying, but what about all the other Mubaraks? The Mubarak in our factory, the Mubarak in our union, the Mubarak in our hospital, the Mubarak who's the police chief, etc. And the question is raised with the lovely phrase of the Portuguese revolution, saneamento, cleansing of society, getting rid of far more than the initial, you know, the symbol of tyranny has gone, but what about all the, old, all, the, all the other little tyrants who were attached to the big tyrants and who were part of his apparatus of rule? And you see people challenging this now in <coughs> Egypt in all sorts of ways, demanding the removal of corrupt trade union bosses, demanding the removal of bosses of, of hospitals and, and, and workplaces, and sometimes winning these demands and sometimes losing them. Again, it empowers people to get rid of the old boss. There's a fantastic story from uh, an Egyptian hospital of them getting rid of uh, the boss and forcing the regime to recognize the, one, the new one that they'd elected, the new manager of the hospital that they'd elected. And this is a period, as uh, both Lenin and Trotsky remark when they're writing about revolutions, in which the process of popular learning speeds up because whole periods of time can go by when nothing seems to change. And in a period when nothing much seems to change or to be able to change, then you don't learn very much. Actually, you're stale. I mean, uh, I felt much more stale in 2010 than I do in 2011. <laughs> Why? Because life is more exciting and you learn faster. You pick up all sorts of things that indicate new ideas to you and new possibilities to you. And uh, some, somebody says it in, uh, I think, in a marvellous pamphlet by uh, Nag, uh, Sami Nagib, uh, the new pamphlet about Egypt, which if you haven't read, it's just a thrilling pamphlet, it's great. Um, I'm so excited about it. I got him to sign it yesterday, so uh, do rush out and get one. Um, he, just, he says, quoting somebody, a few weeks can be like a few decades of ordinary time. Things speed up. People learn faster in a revolutionary period than they do in ordinary times. And one of the things they learn about is their own power. One of the most important things they learn about is their own power. This, the, the sense of popular empowerment. And it, hap it doesn't happen all at once, it happens in a jumpy, jerky sort of a way. Uh, Trotsky, writing about the Russian Revolution, says, the mass of the population in Russia learned by the method he calls the method of successive approximations. They would try this. They'd see where they were, they'd look around. Is this where we are? Is this what we want? and they would then, th then they'd try it out, and then they would try a further thing until finally they came to the conclusion, more and more of them, that actually you know something, the Soviets themselves should take power. It spread amongst them as an idea, and it was not a majority idea at the beginning, it was the property of a tiny minority in February. By October, it's become a mass prejudice. And in the process of all of this, people change, not simply in their ideas, and in their social relationships with their neighbours and their workmates and so on, they even change in terms of their own feelings about themselves. There's a lovely story from, which I'm, if you've heard it before, I apologise for hit, telling it again. The height of the strikes in, in uh, Poland in 1980, there's a woman doctor who was in the Communist Party who wrote an account in a Communist Party magazine about what happened in her hospital as the news came into the hospital that the workers had won massive victories. 
and people started discharging themselves from hospital against medical advice. Not only people who'd been depressed and who were on antidepressants and the rest of it, suddenly they felt much better, but people with broken legs went home, um, <laughs> saying, oh, I don't need, to, don't need the hospital anymore. Feel, and the ward's half empty. And then after a few weeks, they started filling up again. Only now the population of the hospital had changed. The people who are feeling ill now weren't working people who, and most of the people who feel ill in society, they had titles like deputy party secretary, <laughs> uh, foreman, supervisor, manager of this and so on. They were feeling terrible, okay? Because popular power was surging in Poland in, in the autumn of 1980 and the ruling class in Poland was feeling lousy. And so the very balance of mental health, if you like, in the society shifts in a revolution. There's, Lenin puts it beautifully, he says, Revo every revolution is a festival of the oppressed, okay? And the part of it is that very, the, the sense of empowerment and enthusiasm and possibility and the lifting of dark clouds from over your head that can come it, from participation in a rising movement. And people's aims change in the course of a revolutionary process. I, I am, Christopher Hill writes about the English Revolution of the 1640s. He said, this, read one sentence. There were only one or two Republican MPs in the long parliament when it met in November 19, in 1640. Only one or two Republicans. Eight years later, parliament voted to execute Charles I and proclaim the Republic. It was the same people. They changed. The MPs in Britain changed between 1640 and 1649, 1648. They changed the press of events. The very process of the, of the English Revolution led them to develop new aims. The same is true. Robespierre, in nine, um, I, I'm told that Robespierre in 1789 proposed that they should elect a stat, build a statue to Louis XVI. Chopped his head off three years later. Um, so the idea of Soviet power was the property of a tiny minority in February 1917. If you read uh, Lenin, he comes to the idea in April. Didn't have it, didn't come, doesn't immediately in February write, oh, we must immediately start fighting for Soviet power. He looks at the situation afterwards and then starts saying, it's a tiny minority that says it in February 1917. By October, as I said, it's become uh, a mass demand. The crucial question you have to look out for in any revolutionary situation from a socialist point of view is, are there new institutions being built from below by ordinary working people? What do we mean by that? Are there new, more democratic unions being built? More close to the workers, where the, the old union bosses are being kicked out? Is it the case that popular assemblies are being developed in different neighbourhoods? Are there, as in Egypt for example, neighbourhood committees which have been established to substitute themselves for the police, to control the local neighbourhood? Is it the case that new parties are being formed, as in Egypt for example? Is it the case, and you go on and on, is it the case that tenants in, uh, in housing projects are forming tenants committees and, and so on? In, in the autumn of 1980 in Poland, one writer wrote that uh, there was an orgy of popular participation in all sorts of things. Even the stamp collectors reorganized themselves as a democratic uh, self-governing union of stamp collectors of Poland and had a new constitution. So excited were they by the, the growth of solidarity in Poland. What new coalition you need to, you have to look out for this? And the crucial one, of course, is, and, and in other words, a revolution is not simply a process of destruction. It's also, from our point of view, what we have to look out for is the process of popular creation going on. The creativity being exp expressed in new kinds of organizations, new kinds of clubs and associations, and unimaginable different kinds of organizations that are drawing people into beginning to think about what they want and how they might run their own lives. That's absolutely central to what we understand by the growth of workers' power. What new coalitions are being formed? For example, are workers and farmers or peasants uh, finding links with each other of solidarity? Are workers in different industries making links with each other? Are skilled and unskilled workers overcoming their past prejudices and differences? 
very interesting story from the, again from the Egyptian hospital, that the doctors and nurses and porters, faced with a common enemy, it isn't usual for doctors and nurses and porters all to be in the same union, but they formed a new organization together and they had democratic elections in which they all had an equal vote. That's quite something for doctors to do. It takes a revolution. You know, I don't know how many doctors you know, but they tend to be a bit sniffy about porters uh, and not even to notice them often in hospitals. So you have to ask always, you know, always this is a matter of degree, because you don't know until you look at the concrete situation how popular is the, is the movement, how much is it developing these kinds of things, how widespread are these processes, how much control is being contested, and so on. And then, only then, when you ask those sorts of questions, can you ask, in, the, in a revolutionary situation, one in which the state no longer controls everything and there are contenders who are contending and they're getting some popular support, what the balance of forces is and how it is changing. Who is gaining mastery over the situation? Who is gaining resources? Who is gaining support? Who is losing support? Whose forces are being disorganized? What's happening inside the army? Are the soldiers beginning to mutter against the officers? In the police force, what's the relationship between the ranks and the police force? Because in certain cases, the police also can split. A whole section of, uh, the, of the police in uh, Poland was sacked in 1981 for attempting to form a branch of solidarity inside the police force. Sadly, solidarity, which had adopted the position we mustn't threaten the state, didn't go out and try and organize them. Uh, would have helped uh, over, stop, slow down the coup in, 19, uh, in, in December 1981 if they'd done so. You have even to ask who recognizes that, we, you know, if we say this revolutionary situation, who recognizes that we're in a revolutionary situation? Now, I, 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 perfect. I want to talk about Poland for a minute because I think there was a, Pol a revolutionary situation in Poland in 1980-81. Who knew there was a revolutionary situation? The answer is the, the ruling, the old regime, the Communist Party leadership, the army. They knew there was a revolutionary situation and for a period there was nothing they could do about it. And they bided their time and they waited their time and they all reorganized their forces and eventually they struck and they, with, a, with a military clampdown in 18... 16 months after the founding of Solidarity in December 1981. They knew there was a revolutionary situation. They knew the logic of the situation was either Solidarity was going to defeat them or they would have to defeat Solidarity. They won because they knew there was a revolutionary situation, if you like. They knew what the logic of the situation was. Sadly, the leadership of Solidarity denied it. They said, oh, we can come to an agreement with the regime. We must not threaten the regime. Our aim is to form an alliance with the regime. We mustn't threaten them, and so on. The result was they demobilized their own forces. When there, when there was a wave of unofficial strikes, for example, in the autumn, they went around trying, well, Lech Wałęsa, the leader of Solidarity, rushed around Poland, as he said, acting as a fireman, trying to put out the strikes, instead of saying, let's join them together. When soldiers in the army, it was a, it was a what do you call it? A, Conscript. Conscript army, thanks very much. Conscript army wrote to Solidarity and said, help us, we want to leave the army now, rather than be kept in for another three months. Uh, Solidarity didn't do anything about it. Instead of going to the military bases and leafleting and threatening the state by seeking to split the army, they didn't. And what happened, of course, in the end, the army was used against Solidarity in December 1981. Solidarity refused to recognize the leadership refused to recognize there was a revolutionary situation and sadly there were no, not enough lefties around to, 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 to make a difference at that time. What you get in the process, uh, I mean a revolutionary situation is a process of development with upturns and downturns and forward advances and retreats on, on all sorts of sides. There are forays and skirmishes if you like, like in, in a war. Uh, to each side is te tests out the, the other side. So you see, for example, uh, the Egyptian police attacking one strike but not attacking another and so on. And then the question is how do workers respond to an attack, an attack on a strike? The state will be constantly watching how much support uh, particular workers are getting, how, much, how many people turn out for a particular demonstration and the rest of it. On every side you'll see forces testing the water, seeing how far it's possible, measuring the strength 
and the weaknesses of their opponents and so on and sniffing the breeze as it were to see what's possible and it won't be just the the, the leaders of organizations the ordinary people are doing this because they're excited by a revolutionary situation they're involved in politics suddenly what is going on in, in, in society becomes much more interesting. I bet you anything that the readership of newspapers is rising at the moment in Egypt. It's certainly, there were stories from the Russian Revolution of peasants stopping trains just to get the papers off the train so they could find out what was happening in the capital. That must be also, things like that will be happening in Egypt. Far more people are involved in, po in politics today in Egypt, even if they're only in their own locality in terms of local arguments and, and so on. And in such circumstances, questions about strategy and tactics for organized political forces, and especially for the left, become more and more vital. The questions about strategy and tactics and theory become absolutely crucial. There's a difference that uh, I want to make a distinction between a revolutionary situation and an insurrectionary situation. If you like, a further distinction. Because you can have a revolutionary situation in which there is not an insurrectionary situation. And what I mean by an insurrectionary situation, the moment when you have to say, it's time we took power. And knowing what those moments are, and, not knowing, and knowing what they're not, is absolutely vital for any revolutionary organisation. Perhaps I, I'm, I'm going to overlap with uh, what Esme may be talking about in, in the third of these talks. But there's a moment in the history of the Russian Revolution in the middle of the summer, what is known as the July days, half a million workers and soldiers paraded through the centre of Petrograd, the soldiers and sailors carrying rifles in their hands, shouting, Soviet power now! Soviet power now! Five minutes, perfect. <laughs> Soviet power in five minutes. Soviet power in five minutes. Okay, but not now. It's very important, not, not yet. <laughs> And the Bolsheviks went on the streets and they said, comrades, marvellous demonstration, not yet. Sell-out merchants, were they? Compromisers? This is the Bolsheviks, remember? Why did they do this? Because, quite simply, they said, let's look back at history. Let's remember that Paris in 19, 1871 was the only city in France to ha carry through a popular revolution and it was isolated is it the case that all over Russia people are demanding Soviet power now or is it only Petrograd and the estimate was mostly it's only Petrograd a few other places but mostly it's only Petrograd this is not the time to seize power and so you have a situation in which uh, there's a famous account by a Menshevik or social, social, social revolution, I can't remember, anyway, of a, an angry sailor shaking his rifle in the face of the social revolutionary chairman of the Soviet saying, why won't you take the power you bastard when it's offered to you? And the Bolsheviks are saying, not yet, not yet, okay? Because to do so would lead to a disaster. Because not the whole of Russia is not ready yet. So cool it, cool it. And then the revolution actually goes into retreat for a period, for a few weeks, and then rises again on a new basis and, and with more strength. But that's another story, and, I'm, and there isn't time to talk about that. You compare that with what happened, another famous occasion in revolutionary history, at the end of the First World War in Germany, there's a massive revolution that overthrows the Kaiser in November, and in January, the infant inexperienced, young, enthusiastic, foolhardy, ultra-left Communist Party of Germany against the advice of its leaders, uh, Liebknecht and especially Rosa Luxemburg, launches an insurrection, the Spartacus Uprising, in January 1919. And what are their slogans? Leave the unions, Soviet power, you know, workers, control, workers power now, uh, leave the unions, don't participate in elections. And what are the mass of German workers thinking they're joining unions in droves. The, the membership of the trade union movement in Germany in 1919 rose four times. Imagine that kind of union growth, okay? That, yeah, that only comes in a revolutionary situation. You get that expansion. But they cut themselves off from that and they acted alone and they were crushed and tragically Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht and, and other relatives were killed. So the question of politics 
of strategy and tactics becomes absolutely vital for the left, as of course it is also for the right. The right is also strategizing and do, doing its tactical work at the same time. But you have to take a view of the whole movement and its development and not just of the militants and their own impatience. No happy ending to a revolutionary situation is necessary. Revolutionary situations can end with disaster, can end with uh, the ruling class, after all, is also strategizing, is also probing for weaknesses, engaging in trials, trials of strength with the people. A revolutionary situation ends when some political force establishes full sovereignty and, if you like, hegemony over a country again, under new management, as it were. And the question is who? But the range of possibilities is there can be military dictatorship. If Kornilov had won in the autumn of 1917, there would have, we, the, first, the word for fascism would be a Russian word. If uh, in Chile, there was a revolutionary situation in Chile, but who won? The bloody uh, generals uh, who murdered uh, 3,000 militants. In Burma, who, who won? But you know, the Burmese generals. In Nazi Germany, Hitler won. In, Mussolini, in uh, Italy, Mussolini won. It doesn't follow that because of, there's a revolutionary situation that the future is necessarily bright. It depends on the balance of forces. It depends on the political development of the different sides. There can be parliamentary democracy. What's the outcome of the Portuguese revolution? The establishment and stabilization of, pop, of parliamentary democracy thanks to the intervention of the social, demo of social democracy of Europe and NATO backing the new, uh, uh, what was initially, I'm finishing, um, a, a, what was initially a tiny and insignificant socialist party was built up by NATO and, uh, uh, as a, uh, to, to contain the Portuguese revolution. And there also another possibility is that working people really do establish a new kind of, uh, uh, of republic, uh, a popular republic a working class breakthrough. And the key question is, at the end of a revolutionary situation, who is ruling? What is the form of the new state? Is there popular democratic government extending across the whole of economic and social life? Or is there something which requires that we begin the whole bloody struggle all over again? Thanks.